Good morning. If you are a guest with us, you have an outline in your packet of materials that you got when you came in. We will be in Acts chapter 2. Uh, so it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then Acts. So it's fifth book in your uh, New Testament. So you can find that. If you do not have a Bible after the service is over, you can go outside and, and they'll give you a Bible. It's a paperback Bible, the version that we tend to use in the room. So just so you can uh, have your own and write in it and mark in it. It's free, so no worries. Uh, but please uh, take advantage of that. And today is all about, it's the message, as you can see from your outline, is entitled, A Passion to Proclaim. And it's all about uh, us kind of seeing who we are in the world, what we're doing, where we are, and our God story. We call it our God story, which is the uniqueness of your story. All of you have a unique story, and it's unique to you because no, nobody else is you. I don't know if you ever thought about that, but no one else is, in fact, you. And, and so you have your, your unique God story. Like, Mark, you're in the band, yes? Uh, the Marine Band. Uh, and so, so God's writing this story about you in that context. He's giving you the language like we learned last weekend about the other people in the band. And Are there ladies in the band as well? Okay, so it's both men and women. And, and so you're learning the language of them and how to bring God's story through your story to them, and the passion with which you do this, the, the way in which we do it, like the commonality in which we do it, and all of the, this is happening all the time in all of our lives, and, and some of you, like me, some of us, don't particularly like the story that God is writing. How many of you know what I'm saying? Okay, like we don't particularly like the story, I, like sometimes... I wish I could write the story different. Are you with me? Like, like me in my life right now. Uh, how many of you are on my socials? You're, you're, you love me and you're on my socials and the rest of you. Anyway, you can friend me uh, because I put it out on my socials finally. I, I, okay, this is what happened. In November, I, I have a lot of medical issues. So in November, I was having a medical procedure. I think it was in November. Oh, no, 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 actually it was in October. And I have uh, several different urologists that are involved in my life, and I have a condition in my bladder called interstitial cystitis. Everybody say that out loud. Ready? Interstitial cystitis. It's quite a word, uh, two words actually. Uh, and I also have hunter's ulcers in my bladder. So I have bleeding ulcers in this condition in my bladder for which I get treated twice a year. It's rather invasive, but during the hallway conversation, two of my urologists ran into each other, and there is a, a chemical, a chemistry issue that all men have. Men, raise your hands. Okay, I'll put your hands down. Men over 40, raise your hands. Sorry. Uh, just thought I'd out you for a second. So there are several of you. Um, but you, it's important for you to watch your PSA, as you might or may not know. So you, whenever you get a physical, you should have that checked. Anyway, I get mine checked all the time. So my urologist, my PSA spiked, and that means it went up. And so they caught each other in the hall, and Todd said to Emily, Hey, Emily, when you're doing that procedure, fill Mike's prostate and see if you feel anything unusual, which she then did and found a lump. And so then they ultimately ordered, uh, so then I went to the Holy Land, then I came back from the Holy Land, and I had to get what's called a biopsy of my prostate. So they knocked me out again. So I get knocked out, I get knocked out a lot. And I get knocked out, and they do a biopsy pro of my prostate, and they, do, uh, they take little pieces of your prostate, like almost microscopic, but not that little, and they take it from every area of your prostate, in my case. And so they did that, and then they discovered that I, in fact, have cancer in every single area of my prostate. So all of the quadrants of my pro prostate have cancer in them. And then there's this whole Gleason score, and you guys can Google all that, uh, especially men. Um, anyway, obviously, ladies, you don't have prostate. It's God's gift to us. <laughs> anyway, so, so then when that happened, like when it, when it first started happening, you know, like I'm about to get knocked out for my bladder procedure, and so Todd peeks his head into my space and he says, "Hey, I just, I just, you know, your PSA shot up and blah blah blah." This is right before I'm going to get knocked out. So then I get knocked out, and I like as soon as he said that, I had fear rise up in me. Like I got scared immediately, and so then I get knocked out and that whole thing. And then this whole battle with fear ensues and. 
And God, you know, has to constantly remind me of the fact that I have to choose faith, not fear, and I have to understand the why. There are always two whys in everything you go through. One of the whys, always, this is always true, one of the whys is about your relationship with God. Because he's always trying to kind of invade you, if I could put it. He's always trying to get your attention. So he brings these whys in our lives. It doesn't cause them all. I'm just saying he's working in them all. And it's between you and God. And the other reason, the other why always is the people in your life. Like you're in my life. So part of the why of what I'm going through is to empower you to not only go through things in a certain way, but to, to kind of share my life with me so that you can, especially in the context of today, kind of like t- be, be more comfortable with talking about your God story uh, in, a, in a way that's special to you, that's, that really is unique to you, whether you're 8 or 80. It really is God's story and your story wrapped up together. And I don't want this to be like a lot of times I know, and I love this subject, I love the subject of talking about how we share our God story. I just know that this can come off as kind of, oh no, not this again, Pastor Mike, you're going to guilt trip me into sharing my God story, oh my gosh, I don't like it. And I, okay, so get rid of all that guilt. That's from the pit of hell anyway. Just listen to God. Listen to what he's going to say to you today. Listen to how he wants to work your story and my story together and, and how he wants to do it that's so unique to you. Because something is true, and that is when it comes to passion, it's about the intersection of God's grace and your story. It's, a, it's always about the intersection because I now, so I'm in this stage, so they told me, so I met with, sorry, I met with my first uh, oncologist, yeah, I had to get that word right, I met with my, now I have an ongoing oncologist because I had lung cancer, cancer in my left lung seven years ago, so I'm very familiar with cancer, I'm familiar with oncologists and all that, I see an oncologist every three months my whole life, but this one was special, she was a special urology, or yeah, urological oncologist and a surgeon specific to me in this case, and so she said to me, she said, okay, Mike, you have this stage of, of prostate cancer, it's a slow grower, uh, it, it, it's the intermediate stage, but it's the bottom part of the intermediate stage, and so you have to make a decision. So what I want you to do is I want you to go and do research. I want you to meet with doctors, and I want you to you know, go do research over the ne- But now you have three to six months to make this decision. So in three to six months, you have to make a decision as to what you're going to do. And, so there, and, and you know, she basically did the thing to me like, you know, cancer is math, okay? It's like mathematics. And so it's slow. Pro- prostate cancer is slow, but it, it is mathematics. So you've got three to six months, you're going to have to decide. And so I've been doing all this research. I've been doing all this stuff. And what's happened already is I'm starting to go into places and spaces where I've never been before, and I'm meeting tons and tons of people that I don't know, that I've never met before. Why am I there? I'm there for the same reason you are. I'm there to bring the intersection of grace into their lives. Now, Peter in Acts 2 is kind of our our guy that we're going to look at here. But Peter has a very unique experience because of the way God's grace intersected him. One of my favorite stories of Peter and Jesus is post-resurrection. And we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but this is in John 21. It's one of my favorite stories. It's a beautiful story for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons it's one of my favorite stories is because in this scene, Peter and the gang are out fishing, and, and Jesus is on the shore, and you can read the whole story, but Jesus is on the shore, and he's basically making breakfast, which is just a cool idea all in and of itself. How many of you like food? I love food, especially popcorn, you know. Popcorn is my butter delivery system. Okay, so I love popcorn. I love lots of kinds. I like steak. I like a bone-in, dry-aged ribeye. (laughs) And I like ahi. Oh, I like poke. Anyway, I like food. Anyway, I I just think it's cool. 
Jesus, in his post-resurrection body, eats. So you and I, you know, in the end times, you have the rapture, you have the resurrection of your body, the new heavens and the new earth. In that experience, you're going to eat, which is a sick, right? Like, that's just awesome. Plus, Jesus disappears and appears. If you study the accounts, he just disappears and appears, which has profound implications on surfing in the new heaven and the new earth. I am just saying. <laughs> so there's lots of cool stuff in here. But I just think it's awesome because Peter denies Jesus three times and Jesus appears to him, makes him breakfast, intersects his life with grace and says, hey, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, you know I do, Lord. You know I love you. And then the, the, the part of the verse, the kind of climactic part, the end of it is, then feed my sheep, feed my lambs. That's what I get to do in every doctor room I go into. That's what you get to do in every, every room you go into. And this is where the passion comes in, when you get the why. And once your relationship with God is restored, then your passion grows. It just has to. And this is true about you and me and everybody. It's all about the relationship with Jesus. Let's go to his message. Now, go to Acts chapter 2. Now, remember from last week, we were, we were talking about the whole experience of the baptism in the Spirit in Acts 2, where from Acts 1, before Jesus ascends into heaven, he says, hey, you guys hang out until the Holy Spirit comes to you in your life, and he's going to baptize you uh, in the Spirit, and then you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost and whatever. You're going to go be my witnesses. And remember, I've taught you before, the root idea of witness. It comes from the Greek word martyreo, which is the word in your Acts 1. And it's here in this passage as we're going to read when Peter's preaching. It, the root idea of martyr is somebody who lays down their life for another. Okay? That's the root idea. Simple question. Who are we called to lay our lives down for? Who? Yes. Yeah. First, God, right? Then who? Your neighbor. Who's my neighbor? Certainly, Jesus, you don't mean that neighbor with the dog. <laughs> yes, especially that neighbor. Okay? Now, Jesus, so now, Peter, they get baptized in the Spirit. He stands up, and he goes into the explanation of it. We ended at verse 21 last week. So look at verse 22 and following. Here's his, here's his message. Verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. Now, hang on a second. I taught you last week. We are on the Temple Mount. There are tens of thousands of people that come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. We're at Pentecost, 50 days after the, Paso after the uh, Sabbath of Passover. So we're at Pentecost. It's not, a, uh, it's not a mandatory traveling feast to the Israelites outside of Israel. At the time of Jesus, we know this from the rabbis, uh, Josephus and others, we know it. So, but it, it is still, the city would swell by thousands and thousands of people. They are on the Temple Mount in this scene, all right? So and because there is a traveling feast, obviously not all of those people saw the miracles and signs and wonders. He's speaking in generalities, okay? So be careful of the text. Be careful of what you're understanding, okay? Make sure you're, you know how I am. I always want you to have a biblical worldview. Anyway, uh, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate, and this is one of the coolest verses for me in the whole, well, a lot of the Bible, actually. I'll explain it. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. Why is that such a cool passage? Here's why. It puts in tension in one sentence what is often referred to as the sovereignty of God and the freedom of people in one, one verse. And when I say sovereignty of God, what I mean by that is the extreme influence that God has in your life. He's a planner. By nature, God's a planner. He's a strategic person. 
He's very strategic. Uh, and he's like super smart. How many of you know God is super smart? Raise your hand if you know he's super smart. Okay, uh, how, many of you, how many of you play chess? I mean, by that I mean you have played the game. Raise your hands. Okay. All right. So a lot of you have played. So if you've played chess, you know at first, you know, you, you, you know your move, you know, they make a move, you make a move, and that's the extent of your planning. And if, then you grow in the game, right? And so if you grow in the game, you learned how to think three moves out, and, and it's all about the contingencies, right? You, you know the move that you're going to make, but then you anticipate what are they going to make. And if you do this, then they're going to do that. If, they, if you do this, they're going to do that. And you, you think three moves ahead. And then you, if you keep going, you study the game and you really want to play, you know, you learn to think five moves ahead. And then if you get really good at it, you can move eight moves and all the contingencies you know what's going to happen essentially on the board, eight moves, ten moves out. That's very, very sophisticated. Okay, God, he thinks in like tens of thousands of moves, which is trippy. In this passage, Peter's saying God is extremely gnarly at work, but you have made a mess of things. And so what does God do? He does not do this. Oi vey, what am I going to do? He has plans and foreknowledge. He's, it's it's the, one of those beautiful passages that puts together the sovereignty of God and the freedom of man and, and kind of puts them together as much as we are able to understand. It does peg our ability, though, because you can't understand the entire way in which that works. I'm just saying that's what God's doing, and he's doing it right now in your life. He's always doing it. The key is to intersect the grace. Okay, so let's go on. But God, verse 24, but God, notice, raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. Why? Because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. It's impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Why is it impossible for death to keep its hold on him? Paul will later write, Paul's not even a Christ follower in this passage in Acts 2. He becomes a Christ follower later on in Acts. We'll see that story. Paul will later write, and he'll say in, book, in his book to the Romans, he'll say the wages of what? Sin is what? Death, okay? Death couldn't keep its hold on Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is fully God, fully man. Another idea that we cannot wrap our minds entirely around, but it is true nonetheless, because God's super smart. Never forget, God's super smart. So, Jesus, Bible says, was tempted in all ways like us, yet was without what? Sin. So death couldn't keep its hold on Jesus. Jesus is the only innocent one who ever has lived. He's the only sinless one who ever has lived. You and I come in way, way, way second, okay? Way, way, way second. <laughs> and Jesus conquered what you and I are powerless to change. That is your destiny apart from Jesus. How many, raise your hand if you know you are going to die. Raise your hand. If you don't raise your hand, I want to talk with you right afterwards. Uh, <laughs> Jesus changes. He conquers what we are powerless to change. I mean, it, it's been said this. It's been said that death is the great equalizer of all mankind. When I joined the army, I learned this saying, there's no atheist in a foxhole. How many of you have ever heard that term? Yeah, there's no atheist in a foxhole. Though I have met a few. Anyway, uh, but it's the great equalizer. Like, and, and Jesus is the only one who can resolve this for you. Like, if you're still, if you're coming and you're still struggling with, should I begin a relationship with Jesus, you likely are like my French grandma, Mimer. Mimer had what I call a scales theology. This is the way I believed my whole life growing up. I believed that if I was good and the scale of good outweighed the scale of bad, that I go to heaven. I wasn't very confident of it, but when you're young, you don't really think so much about dying. It's not, it's like, it's like not going to happen. But it always is coming our way. It's just about until. All right? Anyway, Mimmer was super scared. And so I, uh, you know, she began to have all this fear. So they call me and they say, Mike, you got to come out and help Mimmer. She's really afraid of dying. And I said, of course, I'll come. So I go out there and I ask Mimmer, about her life. I said, well, what's the fear about? She goes, well, you know, my God. and she, she was at the end of life, and I've been with a lot of people at the end of life, and they kind of all deal with the same issue. She says, Mike, I've, I've tried to be good my whole life, but I don't really know if I'm good enough. 
was such a precious moment in time. And I looked at her. Uh, she's arthritic. She's in a wheelchair. She has rheumatoid arthritis. She has chronic pain all the time. And she's a little person with a wheelchair. And so I, I kind of was on this little chair, so I pulled it up to her. And I looked at her right in her face, and I said, Remember, you're worried about that you're not good enough to go to heaven, right? And she goes, yeah. And you're worried because you've done bad things in your life. Now, this is my grandmother. She's like a saint to me. I mean, Mimir, oh my gosh. It was hard to even conceive of her doing anything bad because she was so awesome. But I know, you know, she's telling me. And I, I go, it's because of the bad things in your life, right? And she goes, oh yeah. And I go, okay, so Mimir, here's the deal. It really doesn't have anything to do with you being good enough. It has something to do with Jesus, who is the only one who was good enough. And that he died which you know, but you, 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 it's just mixed up in your thinking. You know that, but, but you have to begin your relationship with him. You have to quit trying to be good and let him come into your... Let his grace... I'll put it in the context of our conversation today. Let his grace intersect your life and what's going to happen is he's going to come into your life and he's going to bring you forgiveness that you can't earn. You can't do, a, you can't do anything to earn that, that uh, forgiveness. And what he's going to do is he's going to actually enter into your life. And you know what's going to happen, remember? It's not going to be like perfect, instantaneous, but you're going to have a profound sense of peace hit your life. And what's going to happen is your life's going to begin to change. She goes, Really? And I go, yeah, remember, trust me. And I took her to uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God so no one can boast. And so I said, see the Bible? See what it says? And she goes, yeah. And so she, she so then I said, Do you wanna, are you ready to pray? Like, are you done trying to be good? I mean, like, you got to be done. Remember, you got to be done. And she goes, yes, I'm done. And so we prayed, and she cried, and God began to do a work in here that was freaky. By the way, she was blind. So I, this is a long time ago. So I bought her, uh, we, we used to call it the Bible on cassette. Uh, cassettes are like these little, um, uh, the, it's like a tape, like there's tape in it, and, and words get on there. Anyway, so I bought her a, a cassette Bible, the whole thing, big old fat thing. And, and I told her, remember, this is the whole Bible, but really I want you to start with John, okay, John's Gospel. So I, t I told her which tape it was, and again, I had to, t now my mom, who's not a Christ follower, I had to bring my mom in to the room now because mom has to figure out the tape to put in the tape recorder. And so I said, Mom, so remember wants to listen to this stuff uh, all the time, and, and so she can't write anything because she's blind, so you're going to have to kind of listen to with her, and then you're going to, oh, dude, this is awesome. <laughs> this is the beginning, another story for another time, but that's how my mom got saved. So my mom and Mimir, they would write down all their questions, and whenever I'd come, to the house. It's like Bible Answer Man showing up. And she changed so much in six months, it was freaky. And then she experienced the ultimate healing of life, which is heaven. But it all happened because of that. And in, when it comes to Jesus, his death fulfills all the promises. His death is the climactic thing. Look what Peter says. Look, look what he says. Look, look in the Bible. He says, now he's going to jump into David, the king from a thousand years ago, who wrote prophetic songs, but didn't really know what he was writing about. Oftentimes prophecy is this way. Look at what Peter says. David said about Jesus, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will rest in hope, in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. And then he breaks out of the song, this prophetic song from David, uh, Psalm 16, and he says, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. We, have not, we do not have that archaeological dig, but that is in the city, ancient city of David. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. This is why Jesus had to be of the Davidic line. Seeing that what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life, 
and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out on you guys. That's what happened earlier in this experience in Pentecost. What you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven. Remember, he's prophesying. But he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies uh, a footstool, footstool for your feet. So David, Peter is unfolding a prophecy that occurred a thousand years earlier that David couldn't have had any idea of what it was really about. He was just writing a song. He was writing a song about what he saw. And Jesus is the hero in the story. And he's the only way to God. He's the only way to heaven. Peter is simply pointing out what Jesus said elsewhere, where Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one, not Mimir, not you, not me, comes to the Father except by means of him, what he does for you. We're going to take communion together. This is the central idea of communion. Those of you who are serving the elements, you guys can go ahead and start serving. And if you're new with us, okay, you take a little cup thing full of the little juice and then the uh, bread and the wafer in there, and then you take, you know, just hold them in your hands until everybody's served, and then we'll take it together. But, but look, the core idea of communion is this, that Jesus is the only way. Mimmer, you, me, it's always about the grace of God intersecting your life. You can't do it. You're not made to do it. Only Jesus can do it. Only he can bring peace in the midst of my cancer. Only he can bring mission in the midst of my life and going into hospital rooms and, you know, depending on the therapy I choose, treatment, whatever you want to call it, there's different ways that'll roll out. I'll tell you guys. I'll put it on my socials and stuff as that unfolds. But only he can... Because I have the cray-cray in my head. And left to myself, the cray-cray rules. Cray-cray wins. Cray-cray is like the cassette tape. Over and over and over again. Rewind over and over. It's cray-cray. And, you know, there's science behind this now. Uh, Neuroscience. Uh, that now we know, yeah, when you get into the cray-cray, it actually makes grooves in your brain. And, and now you're kind of hardwired for cray-cray. And so... The part of the Bible teaching is to replace the cray cray with the be transformed by the renewing of your what's it say? Mind. And then as you put scripture and the thoughts of God in your head, that it actually literally changes the uh, physiology of your brain. It actually changes your brain chemistry. It's like freaky how God made us. So I mean, He's so smart, He's so amazing. That's why I love science. Because every time I see the new discovery of science, I go, wow, Lord, that's crazy. Who could have ever thought that? But you did. It's amazing, right? Now I'm going to pray for the elements. So bow your heads with me and close your eyes, and then we'll eat the bread and drink the cup. So Father... Here we are in this holy space thinking about our God story and you and how we don't have to be good enough, that you, you come in and you make us good. You, you, you start us on this journey toward goodness. And we experience, you know, more and more, relatively speaking, of goodness in our lives. But it's not because we're like working it out. <laughs> But we are collaborating, but Lord, it always begins and ends with grace. And so we eat this bread and drink this cup, not out of, um, I don't know, some kind of fakery or whatever, magic. It, it, it's because of who you are in our lives. You're with us. So Lord, as we, as it's even trippy, Lord, like when we eat this, it becomes a part of our body. It goes through our blood system to every little blood vessel in our body. And so I pray, God, that on a, on a I mean, it's literal, we're going to eat it, but like I pray that your spirit would invade every area of our lives. So let's eat the bread.
and then you can go ahead and drink the cup. Thank you, God. Just say to him, thank you, God. Just say it out loud. Just say, thank you, God. Ah. Mm. It's good, isn't it? So that's the communion. That's the intersection of grace. And then the idea develops, okay? The idea develops. Like, what else does it mean? To, you know, what else is God doing? It's about your story, okay? I, I put it this way on the outline. Hitch my story to the story God's writing. It's about Peter is hitching. He's getting it. See, the baptism of the Spirit happened. The grace has intersected his life. He's had the miracle. And now he's hitching his story. Again, it's just crazy that Peter's speaking to me in the passage, like weird. And, and that's why we are all witnesses to it. We all have our lives. This, okay, this is true whether we know it or not. I'm just saying the more aware I am of it, the more I am aware existentially. I mean, like on Monday at 9 a.m., I'm aware that I'm actually living God's story, not, not just my story. My story is hitched to His and the Holy Spirit is, is empowering me that I, I, my part is significant. Your part is significant. And it's viral. It's like literally all the time. Uh, how many of you ever take Lyft or Uber? I take it all the time everywhere. That is your future, by the way. They won't be driven by people. They'll be driven by robots. But your future, should you choose this mission... It's coming. Anyway, I take Lyft and Uber everywhere. I was in Austin this week uh, spending time with my family. I flew back on Wednesday, so I get in this Lyft, you know, I get in a Lyft, and there's an older guy driving it, and I always ask, I, if I'm by myself, I like to sit in the front, so I ask the dude, uh, well, he, older, <laughs> he was younger than me, but he was older. Anyway, so I go, hey, can I sit in the front? And you know, you always get the, the guy's name on the phone, right? So whatever his name was, oh, his name was Harvey. So I go, hey, Harvey, can I sit in the front? seat of your car, and he goes, sure. So I get in the front seat, and I go, and I have questions. So I have kind of a set bunch of, say, 20 questions that I can ask any Lyft driver that gets me into their God story, because I'm always after the why of the Lyft. Like, why are you in a Lyft? <laughs> like, I revolutionize every Lyft drive you ever get in. Raise your hand if you've ever been on a Lyft or Uber. Okay, this will revolutionize every, every, every time you get in the car. Move into the why. So I have questions. So I say, my questions are generally like this. Hey, uh, how long have you been driving today? And he said, like, forever, whatever. And I go, oh. I go, uh, how long have you been driving for Lyft? And he said, you know, like, it was something like three years. And I said, oh, how's that working for you? He goes, well, it was, um, it's been kind of rough. It's been kind of rough, actually, the last seven years. And I said, why has it been rough? Notice I keep asking him questions. You just keep asking questions. And he goes, well, because about seven years ago, my marriage broke up, and I would guess the dude to be about 62, maybe. He's a hard 62, but about 62. Do you know what I mean when I say hard 62? Just check him. If you don't, you can Google that. Uh, anyway, so, so, you know, he said, about seven years ago, my marriage broke up. It was kind of a bummer, and I said, well, describe it to me. And he said, okay, and so he gave me some of the details that I won't share, but and I said, I said, oh, and he, and he goes, yeah, and then I got the flu really bad, hit the hospital, and it turned into pneumonia, and I had pneumonia for, and I was recovering from that for like eight months, and I go, whoa, and he goes, yeah, um, and during that time, because I was on the skids, so to speak, I lost my house, I lost my truck, and he was a heavy equipment mechanic, I lost my truck, and I lost my tools, he had to sell everything. And, he go, and, I, and he, I said, is that how you got in the lift? And he goes, yeah, I had to get in the lift. But, but uh, when I started with lift, I didn't have a vehicle, so I had to lease a lift through them. And it was great, but it cost me a lot of my money and everything. And I go, whoa. Now, I was about to intersect, okay? Because the Holy Spirit was saying, I thought, intersect. I don't always read him right. How many of you don't always read the Holy Spirit right, okay? <laughs> See, I can go on default. Okay, so I was on a mission, so I'm, I'm about to go on default, and then, uh, then he, I said, so I was about to go into my God story, and, and uh, he, then he said, he said to me, he said, but you know what's amazing is how faithful 
God has been to me over the past seven years. And I said, really? And he goes, yeah. He goes, like, it's crazy how much power is in my relationship with God. I go, really? He goes, yeah. And then he starts to describe his life group. To me, he's in a life group. So he starts to describe his life group to me. And I'm like, no, whoa, like, like that, right? And he goes, yeah, and even financially. Like in the last uh, year and a half, I was able to save, I, I think he's been through Financial Peace University because he talked like Dave Ramsey. He said, he said, yeah, in the past year and a half, I've been able, even though I'm broke, I've been able to save $7,000. That's totally Dave Ramsey, okay? Like, you know, he gets it. No matter how poor you are, you can save money, okay? You just adjust your lifestyle to how much money God's entrusted to you. That's it's a crazy-making belief. Anyway, so he's, he's got the bucket. So in a year and a half, I saved $7,000, and the car you're riding in, this car, I bought. I, I bought it. Like, I bought this car. And now, I, now I'm on a totally different financial plan. I go, oh, that's so awesome. And uh, by then, we're kind of getting, we're on the road now going to the airport in Austin, and then I out myself to him. And he goes, no way, you're a believer? And I go, I know you couldn't tell it, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was just super cool. And, and my point is, Harvey gets why he's a Lyft driver. Do you? That's the why. Because see, when this happens, you get to share God's story that makes changes for generations. Harvey's got a couple of grown kids his relationship with God is very, very powerful in their lives. And trust me, and by the way, I travel all the time. I meet hundreds of people every year, people I don't know. I cannot tell you how rare it is that somebody invites me to church or tells me their God story. It hardly ever happens. May that not be true of us. Because we get to share in this. Like Sarah was talking earlier about kids' ministry. And, you know, don't just give to kids' ministry. Spend tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars across all the campuses on kids' ministry. That's awesome. But you can go, you can serve in kids' ministry, and you can be the change agent in that generation of child. Because somebody needs to love those children. That's the deal. Look at Peter's sermon. Look at what he does. So he's preaching, right? When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to now, what does that mean, Pastor Mike? What does that mean? They take out a knife and no, it means the Holy Spirit. Peter's doing his part. You're doing your part. The Holy Spirit's doing his part. Who's doing the cutting? The Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has the most amazing, like scalpel. He's able to cut your heart at exactly the right place. They were cut to the heart, and, the, and they asked Peter, holy cow. Look at the Bible. It says that right there. Holy cow. What should we do? Now, Peter says something that I want to put in context for you. He says, now, he's speaking in Aramaic. Acts is written in Greek. In Greek, the word is metanoia, basically. Met metanoia. How many of you have ever heard this word, metanoia? Raise your hand if you've ever heard this word. This is a common word. You guys read? <laughs> metanoia, it means a change of mind, a change of worldview. The NIV translators translate it repent. I am merely suggesting that if you're sharing your God story and the Holy Spirit convicts the person of sin and they say, what should I do? I would encourage you, don't let the first word out of your mouth be repent. Culturally, in English, that word today, that will pretty much end the conversation. They won't know what you're talking about. Remember last week we talked about how the Holy Spirit came and baptized them all and gave them the language of, their, of people that they didn't know. So remember last week, the lesson of that is you're to learn the language of the people. So I would put it differently. Put it in the whole context of, G, of uh, Peter's conversation with them. He's telling them about Jesus. What does repentance mean? Metanoia, 
also means this. Watch me. It means this. It means I'm walking in one direction because I believe something. Okay? It means literally stopping. The, and Okay, so if I'm walking this way and I don't know Jesus, I'm trying to live my life. I'm trying to live by the purposes of my life as I understand them. I'm trying to be mimmer. I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to whatever. Metanoia means, whoa, I don't have to be good. Hear me out. Careful. <laughs> we are in Southern California. Um, it means I, I don't have to be good to make it good. What does metanoia mean? It means I turn around. This is literally what repentance means in the Greek. Uh, and in Hebrew, it's the same thing. Um, it means turning around and walking in the other direction. What's that mean? Okay, I, I admit, Jesus, you are the only one who's good and the only one who can save me from my brokenness. I turn around and I walk after you. I follow your purposes and plans for my life. I won't do it perfectly. And you're going to help me. You're actually going to be the one who, by your spirit, makes me good, actually. I'm going to collaborate for sure, there's, there's work involved. It's just always grace intersecting first. Grace moves. Grace changes me. I can't change myself. This is not, Christianity is not behavior modification. Behavior modification has a tremendous truth to it. It's just that this completes the idea. And then look at what the passage says. Go to the bottom. It says, they all, uh, he says, uh, with many words he warns them, pleads with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation those who accepted his message were baptized, 3,000 people in that event. Imagine that happening here. 3,000 people getting saved and baptized. By the way, where were they baptized? They were baptized where Teresa and I are standing. This is in the Pool of Siloam. It's at the southern end of the great city of David, the ancient city of David. I'll show you another picture. This is a picture from the opposite direction. This is a fairly new archaeological dig. One of the things that's cool about it is that you get to go in it. Uh, remember, I've taught you before, Jews self-immersed three times every time they went to temple. Baptism was mainstream in Judaistic first century culture. What's the difference? They are now getting baptized because of Jesus. Okay? Okay. And if you've never been baptized, you ought to get baptized as our next baptism. We'll talk about it, and we do it this one on campus. But this is actually the pool. Now, this pool went on. There's houses right here, so they didn't knock down all the houses. They just wanted to uncover the archaeological site so that we would see the pool of Siloam. That's where they all get baptized. That's why our faith, ladies and gentlemen, is not built upon some philosophy or some you know, epiphany that happens or whatever. It's because of historicity. Your faith is locked into time and space and facts. Jesus actually was born. He actually died. He actually rose from the dead. 3,000 people on the Temple Mount get baptized in the Pool of Siloam as a result of the Holy Spirit convicting them of their brokenness. That is the deal. And when you speak up, the Holy Spirit does His part. This isn't just Peter. Peter. It's not just you driving a lift. There's someone else working always. The key is to pay attention to it and to lean into it. All he wants us to do is to be courageous. Courageous. Later on in Acts, they see Peter and John and they can't get over them. They're like, what happened to you guys? They're like, well, we've been with Jesus. <laughs> You've been with Jesus. That's, that's where it all comes together. And, and, and that's why every space and place becomes holy. So in Discover Your Pathway, we teach you how to share your God story. We talk about how your life before Christ, how you became the Christ, and then your life after Christ. Now, this is the essential, simplest way for you to share your faith. What was life like before you got saved? Oh, man, I, if you, those of you familiar with my story, you know my story. It's, I can go on and on. And then, you know, how I became a Christ follower, and then what happened since. But a lot of you are stuck right here. How many of you grew up in church? Raise your hands, you grew up in church. Okay, so a lot of you. All right, so you get stuck. And you get stuck because, well, you know, when I was seven, I accepted Christ, and I don't really know what it's like to not be that way. So let me help you. Um, I've done this so many times, it's been so helpful to people. 
and, and this is true in general, frankly, I, I, would, I would encourage, like, like, so pick a pain. Pick a pain. When I say pick a pain, how many of you have a pain that comes to your head right immediately? You got a pain, right? Okay, most of you. Pick a painful circumstance. Pick something that you've been through. Uh, divorce, a uh, loved one die, doesn't matter. It could be any pain, uh, you know, like, like having a baby, uh, <laughs> whatever. It could be any pain, okay? Talk about the pain. Talk about the difference that Jesus made around the pain. That's your God story. And that's what you're charged with. That's what you're a trust of. You're, you're a steward of this. Okay, so we're going to... Uh, I wish I had time to ask, have you ask me questions right now, but I don't. So we're going to do like an exercise, okay? Look at this question. Who in your world needs to hear your God story, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for you that the Holy Spirit's going to speak to you right now, and He absolutely will, okay? He's going to speak to you right now, okay? So bow your heads, close your eyes. So God, I pray right now that you will speak to every single person in this room and you will put a face in our heads of somebody that we need to share our God story with. It's somebody we know. Uh, and it could be somebody that's going through a similar pain that we've been through. It could be somebody that, I don't know, it could be anybody, Lord. It could be somebody we don't like. Put the face in our heads. Holy Spirit, you, you do it. Show us. Okay, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, how many of you have a face in your head right now? You got a, a face came into your head. Raise your hands up. Okay. I'm going to give you another minute. Put your hands down. Holy Spirit, do your work. Only you can do this. Help us not to just think with our minds. Help us think with our hearts, with our souls, with our spirit. Mm. Okay, now this is what we're going to do. Everybody look up at me. Okay. Watch this. I'm about to snap my fingers and something's going to happen. Watch. Wait. It was a little late. Okay, those are glass walls. They, I mean, you, if you've never been up there, you don't know that. They're glass. This is a little pen. So this is how we're going to end. I want you to go up there, and I want you to write the first name of the person whose face is in your head as a statement of faith. That, and, and so you, you have a next step. I don't know what it is. I mean, besides this, this is your next step. The next step is, I don't know what it is, maybe pray for the person, maybe commit to praying for him for like a week or something like that. Um, maybe the Lord's going to tell you to write him a letter. Maybe the Lord's going to have you make a phone call. Maybe the Lord's going to just have you bring up, you know, like on Monday. What's the big question on Monday? Everybody asks the same question on Monday. What's the question? How was your weekend, right? And so on Monday, when they ask, how's your weekend, you're going to tell them how your weekend was. Well, on Saturday, I went to Torrey Pines and saw the farmers. It was awesome. Uh, too bad Phil Mickelson didn't make it, whatever. And then on Sunday, I went to the church. I heard this amazing message from this bald dude. And then uh, in the afternoon, I went on blah, blah, blah. And you just lace in the first part of your God story. And then the next time... You get a little bit more, a little bit more, whatever, whatever, okay? But this is how we're going to end, okay? You're going to go up there, write the name down on the wall, and you can pray as you go, but there's a lot of you, and I only have like 10 uh, markers on each side, <laughs> so just be sensitive to that, okay? Ready, set, go. Have fun. <laughs>